But of course, analysis is a two-way street. The fraction of a sign also deprives the analyst of any sense of mastery. Insofar as each analysis and is singular and to at least some degree constantly changing, he's different in each session, he is not a pre-given subject awaiting categorization, but an outside forcing the analyst to affirm the unforeseeable and the unexpected. Patient B forces his analyst to think otherwise. Imminence. Both are philosophers of imminence. For Deleuze, everything interacts with everything else. Similarly, according to Marie, sorry, Mirai Andres, in Lacan, nothing is given. Not all Lacanians agree with this, but I'm with Mireille on this one. In Lacan, nothing is given. Everything interacts with and is transformed by everything else. Everything affects everything else. Although things may appear transcendent, they are the effect of a process. Lacan would echo Deleuze. Transcendence is always a product of imminence. Recall the turtle and the fence post. Nothing transcends the analytic situation. Contra Derrida, there are no transcend transcendental signifiers. Derrida was only able to suggest their existence by ignoring the performatives in play. Lacan makes this point through his style. While proclaiming a return to Freud and thereby suggesting that Freud can function as a point of origin and authority outside the investigation, he subverts Freud's authority by parodying him. To be ejected that far from being a thinker of imminence, there are moments in Lacan's teaching that suggest a transcendent element, most notably in his conceptualization of the subject. But this is to miss the point. Lacan's position is that we tend to install entities and signifiers as transcendent, in other words, there's a pathology of the transcendent. For example, in the mirror stage, there's no outside of the play of mirrors, but the child imagines that there is a transcendent others, other who can act as a guarantor. To investigate this pathology, the analyst must seek a meta-language, i.e. a transcendent language, but he does so in the knowledge that the attempt will fail. The event of analysis will never yield to the dominion of meaning. Whenever there is this transcendence, vertical being, Imperial state in the sky on an earth, writes Deleuze, there is religion. Indeed, as Lacan observed 20 years before, meaning is always religious. It will be immediately objected that while there are certain points of resonance and similarity in the work of Lacan and Deleuze, these are far outweighed by the tensions and even conflicts between them. In stressing the divergences between the two thinkers, Deleuzeans would point in particular to the vexed areas of desire and subjectivity. So let's now consider each. Desire. Deleuze, opposing creativity to negativity, emphatically contrasts his concept of desire from that of Lacan. Desire, he insists, is not lack. Its point of departure is not the monka etre. Rather, it's an impersonal and productive force. Apparently, only priests and their modern counterparts, psychoanalysts, think otherwise. But again, matters are more complex than the textbook versions suggest. Lack in Lacan is the occasion for desire, but this is not simply our tragedy. We never attain the object of our desire. It is also, note the Derridian echo, it is also our chance. As Zizek puts it, the absence is generative. Once again, direct quote from Derrida, of course, but he gets it from Lacan, impossibility is the condition of possibility. Deleuze and Lacan share a structuralist heritage. As such, they affirm the existence in any structure of a feature which Deleuze terms the empty square, at once a gap and an excess. It is the empty square which keeps the structure open and dynamizes it. Lack plays a similar role in Lacan's thinking. Like the place of the king and the place of the dummy, it opens the situation up to movement. It is the incompletion which sets in motion and enables transformation through the encounter with the other. Today's task, wrote Deleuze, is to make the empty square circulate and to make pre-individual and non-personal non -personal singularity speak. Similarly, Lacan is concerned to set in motion so that what is excluded, subject self-conception, can transform the subject. For Lacan, as for Deleuze, desire never attains a final destination. As there is becoming, no completion is possible. But this is our opportunity. Hysterics may think it's all or nothing, but that is precisely what prevents them getting on with their lives. If we attained the object of a desire, there would be indifferentiation, fusion and death. 
desire is life. Of course, most people lament the absence, but Lacan does not. Lacan, with a Spinozist heritage, remember as a schoolboy, he actually had pages from the ethics pinned on his bedroom wall, Lacan, with a Spinozist heritage, has no truck with such sad passions. Melancholia, for the lost object, is a desire to be done with desire, and hence with life. Insofar as love harbors the fantasy that the other exists, Lacan would agree with Deleuze that the desire to love and to be loved is a sniveling desire. Analysis proceeds by disrupting such desires when they emerge in the transference. Desire and hysteria may be associated with negation. This is not it. But insofar as desire is neither goal nor end point, as it <clears throat> is always, so to say, in the middle, it is to be affirmed. Hence, as the conclusion of Seminar 11 recalls, the desire of the analyst is not a pure desire, but a desire for absolute difference. Reading Lacan from a Deleuzean come Nietzschean perspective, we could say that there's no such thing as desire in itself. Rather, there are active and reactive modes of desires, where each mode is a symptom of a particular evaluation and style of life. Lacan famously claimed that he didn't have, it, as I mentioned before, a system only a style, and his style is that of le gay savoir, which Lacan, of course, wrote with a C. There is, wrote Badieu, a trait of Deleuze that I particularly appreciate, a sort of unwavering love for the world as it is. It is a love Lacan shared. Right, next batch topic, the subject. Here the contrast seems particularly sharp. While Deleuze wishes to break with the world of subject and object, Lacan talks of little else. Where Deleuze thinks in terms of pre-individual modes, of free-floating intensities that belong to no one and circulate at a level beneath into subjectivity, Lacan devotes himself to the analysis of subjective structures. Furthermore, it would be argued that with the subject, the transcendent is less than surreptitiously smuggled back in. Whenever a writes like Deleuze, imminence is interpreted as imminent to something, the concept becomes a transcendent universal. We can be sure that something reintroduces the transcendent. So the charge is that Lacan clings to a trans traditional theory of the subject as, say, underlying substance. An immediate response would be that Lacan no more subscribes to such a theory than, say, Heidegger. Just as Heidegger spoke of Dasein rather than the subject, so Lacan talks of the parlatra. Like Dasein, the B speaker, is as much spoken as speaker. It would be easy to then draw out a number of parallels with Deleuze. Insofar as subject and object come into being, they are derivative of a process in which the individuation of a new object is inseparable from a new individual individuation of the subject and in which not everything is actualized. The differences here are more important. Firstly, although Deleuze, like both Lacan and Derrida, believes the notion is indispensable and ineliminable, he does not consider the subject a useful starting point for thought. For Lacan, on the other hand, the treatment of patient B requires some determination of the subjective structures and processes in play. As we can, as, as we've seen, there can be no adequate determination, but the attempt, destined to fail, though it must, doesn't fail though it must, has to be made. This is why in Lacan's teaching there is no single theory of the subject, but rather theories. Hence the site, just a few of them are obvious examples. At different moments we find the Hegelian subject, emphasized in the Derrida's critique, who appropriates himself in full speech. The Heideggerian subject, who is the choice of the event. The Sartrean subject, whose unfathomable decision determines his existence. The structuralist subject, who is the effect of the signifier, and conceptions of the subject original to Lacan himself, for example, the subject as response of the real, and the subject as a nothing. Now, <clears throat> why are there so many theories? Quite simply, because none succeeds. As so often in his teaching, Lacan fails and signals his failure. The theory of the subject is the cardinal instance of his approach to the question of a meta-language mentioned above. Secondly, Lacan is more interested in the nature of the subject's organisation than Deleuze. While Deleuze insists that structures matter and that complete dismantling incurs precisely the dangers outlined by Lacan, 
he is more concerned with what precedes organizations and the possibility of their becoming otherwise. 